Hello and welcome to Key News at Amherst Media. My name is Wendy Blumenthal and joining me today is a wonderful guest, Dr. Susan Sheridan, here to talk about the importance of scribbling. Dr. Sheridan is a lifelong teacher, mother, grandmother, community member, and she's been studying um, drawing and writing and scribbling for decades now. And uh, we bumped across her by accident and I have completely fallen head over heels in love with her work and I'm just honored to have her here today to just to begin a conversation that I hope turns into several conversations about the work you do. So Dr. Susan Sheridan, do you want to say just a few words while we get going? And then I'd love to start us off by just talking about um, if you can try to, in a synopsis, kind of give us a little bit about the importance of scribbling and how you started this process. Right. Well, first of all, I'm very touched that you found me on my website and that you have a three-year-old and therefore you're really interested in scribbling. Um, probably 25 years ago, I started to think about drawing and writing, and uh, I was actually doing my dissertation at UMass, and uh, usually you're supposed to do a great deal of research and then come up with your uh, thesis topic, but I knew I wanted to write about the connections between drawing and writing, and I found that the only place where these activities were connected is if I use brain science, because if art education had been going to connect drawing and writing, they would have. At that point, writing education, and I went to see Lucy Calkins in New York, mm -hmm. and she said, why would you want to use drawing? Mm -hmm. So that was a long time ago. But um, the, it wasn't obvious that they were connected. Mm -hmm. And um, so in 1997, I published my first book, which is Drawing, Writing, and the New Literacy. And this was about 10 years of work. And this mm -hmm. combines the five-step drawing writing process that I figured out no. really while I was at UMass. And that's a protocol that's used at, in as many places as you can get in to talk to. I, exactly, yeah. because I've tried, I've done it with um, elementary school children, middle school children, and I was an art teacher and an English teacher and nice. did some science education, so I would use drawing writing as, quote, the method of delivery. Uh -huh. And the, the sort of the super thing about this is that there's five little drawing steps, and they're really what you would be doing in an art school. Mm -hmm. So you do uh, the child first or the adult, and mm -hmm. I've done this with elder hostlers and college students at nice. Westfield State in uh, art education. Uh, they draw the object as well as they can and write about it in any way they choose to, which gives you a, a pretest. Mm -hmm. And then you move into a blind contour drawing, regular contour, uh, Euclidean basic shapes, so mm -hmm. circles, triangles, and squares, mm -hmm. break the object down into that. Light, medium, and dark, so you work with value, and then at that point, you move from magic marker, and I use magic marker in the beginning so that people can't erase, mm -hmm. don't worry about erasing, mm -hmm. and then goes. It's not a right or wrong. That's right. Just do it. Well, you have to, yeah, and you have to work with, with how mm -hmm. you how you've drawn the object, and then uh, to a pencil drawing, which I call the perfect hole. And by then, the the uh, student is really a pretty powerful drawer mm -hmm. because they've incrementally seen more and more and more and more. And each time they draw, they have to say, for instance, my blind contour drawing tells me that my object is. Mm -hmm. We examine the line quality of that drawing and generate all the language for line quality. Wow. And then when we do basic Euclidean shapes, we generate all those shapes. We have all the names for all those shapes. And so there's a huge amount of information and vocabulary yeah. built into this. Yeah. So by the time someone has done this drawing writing five step and it takes about two weeks, their drawing skills are vastly improved. Along with a number of other things. A number of other things, yeah. ability to generate yeah. simile, metaphor, analyze, yeah. make inferences. Yeah. And their vocabulary is much bigger because um, every time we generate a new word, I write it down and everyone writes it down. Beautiful. So do you do this as a, as a group this, or is this done one on one? Well, the, I do it as, you know, teacher group. Mm -hmm. but. Students share in peer pairs, which is extremely okay. efficient. So you model about h how do you share mm -hmm. a drawing and a piece of writing, and the child mm -hmm. will hold it up to the other child, and the other child will ask questions. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about, can you tell mm -hmm. me about, you know, no negative things mm -hmm. like, but well, you could say that part is hard sure. for me to read. Can you explain it to me? Mm -hmm. And then the child who's done the writing reads that aloud so they own it, and the other child listens and asks questions, but then chooses one word from the writing of the peer partner, and that word gets put up on whatever you have, mm -hmm. a whiteboard or a blackboard. Mm -hmm. 
So every peer pair sharing, you generate four new vocabulary words, which is then mm -hmm. shared with the entire group. So the ex is an exponential growth in, in the use yeah. of language, and the words are generated by the children. Nice. And if you don't understand things, you can use a dictionary and nice. you know, build from there on. So first I wrote this book, and I have um, facing pages which have extra information if, if someone wants to really understand Euclidean geometry mm -hmm. or is fascinated by fractals. I tried to provide a lot of information so that as um, a teacher worked through this, they can teach it by reading aloud. Okay. So they themselves sit there and read, read aloud, and then they do the, the, uh, the drawing writing exercise with the students. Okay. So the teacher shows how important the process is. Mm -hmm. They are totally engaged in it. They don't just sit there twiddling their thumbs while yeah. the children do this. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're growing all the time. Absolutely. It's an so active engagement. It's very active. How do you yeah. get, um, how imperative is it that your teachers, that you, that you want to target with that particular book and the, and the protocol itself, understand brain development and the neurobiology? Because right. you're really right. coming at this, as I you try. said, from a neurobiology right. lens, right. through a neurobiology lens. So right. how important is it that the teacher or the parent be able to speak in terms of right. Euclidean and fractals right. and, right. and syn exactly. synapses and stuff like exactly. that? Exactly. Well, I have a section in this particular book called uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to Brain Science. Nice. So I tried to give a little overview of, mm -hmm. of brain science. But the, the basic thesis of, of drawing writing is that the brain has two sides. Mm -hmm. They're connected by the corpus callosum. Mm -hmm. So they don't exist separated from each other unless you have epilepsy and you've had what's called a commissurotomy. Mm -hmm. So we have a connected brain. And in general, the left side is where language and beliefs are located. And in general, the right side we used to think was where drawing and spatial relationships occurred. As I'll say a little bit later, I've learned an awful lot more about the right side of the brain and a great deal more about the left okay. in studying sound. So yeah. my, I'm growing in my understanding. But the simplest thing is we have a right and left side. They've evolved to do slightly different things. And by doing drawing, writing, we're encouraging them to share information to across play together. The, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And the drawings will go farther because of the writing, and the writings will go farther because of the drawings. And by starting with drawing, I started with what the child does first, Beautiful. does spontaneously, mm -hmm. is usually interested in, and can get incredibly good at, mm -hmm. even if their language skills uh, you know, trail behind. Mm -hmm. So it really is a win-win. And having mm -hmm. done this for so many years with so many different populations, sometimes just an all-day session, sometimes uh, a week-long thing, I would see such changes, whether they were adults or elder hostlers mm -hmm. or, or children, uh, so much excitement, uh, being amazed, really amazed by their own drawings. At what they produce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just yeah. blown away. And it, well, it's very exciting. Yeah, and the, the level of confidence Yes. and pride yes. and ownership yes. and just kind of living in yourself yes. and being completely yes. okay with that. Yes, and that's, that's what, what drawing will yeah. really do is, is yeah. give that sense of well, confidence. As you mentioned, I'm a proud, beyond proud parent of an amazing three-year-old girl right. whose language has been, her language has been a little delayed. Right. Um, and I usually make sense of that as we did a lot of sign language with her when she was that's younger. That's wonderful. Um, and so her verbal didn't come on right. real quickly. Right. But she has from the get-go Right. scribbled very intentionally, right. very focused, right. um, very methodical, and now that she has the verbal skills, she's very clear about what she's drawing, and she will ar articulately tell you exactly what's happening there, and there's right. reason, and there's a stopping point, a starting point, right. and there's a certain, when she's painting, there's a particular brush technique, there's all kinds of things that it's just so incredibly wonderful to watch. Those are the most important points, which actually drove me to the next two books because I hadn't considered scribbling. Mm -hmm. And what you say, what is your daughter's name? Clara. Clara. Clara knows how to scribble. Mm -hmm. So scribbling and drawing are spontaneous behavior. No one teaches children to scribble or draw. Mm -hmm. And with very young children, their behavior is necessary 
A child doesn't decide to cry. Mm -hmm. They don't decide to reach. They don't decide to use their eyes to find edges yeah. and lights and darks. They don't decide to scribble. It's it's a it's instinctual. It's a yeah. It's a yeah. spontaneous behavior that's important to their whole mind body development. And when you say that Clara knows what she scribbled, mm -hmm. as her language develops, she will be able to talk about mm -hmm. her scribbles. Those descriptions may change from time to time, yeah. but it doesn't make any difference yeah, because what she's actually doing is reading. Yes. So she's yeah. scribbling, and scribbling is the wellspring from which not only drawings come, but writing, yeah. mathematical notation, and musical notation. Mm -hmm. So as I've, you know, year after year, you know, I'll take a little rest sometimes, <laughs> but then I think, oh, now what about scribbling? Yeah. And then you see that proteins wiggle that that at the heart of all biological activity is this wiggle, 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 wiggle. And uh, children wiggle. To be yep. alive is to wiggle, yep. is to be scribbling. Mm -hmm. um, That's really cool. I never, I never thought about it at that level. I mean, I guess to some extent. Um, you think of protozoa. I mean, sure. scribbling and, and, and uh, basic biological movement are similar. Yeah. And my feeling is that what I call marks of meaning or marks of significance, which are embedded in or spring from scribbling are what make us really different from mm -hmm. other creatures. So mm -hmm. I did a lot in these, the next two books, some in this first book, but I wrote a book called, oh. two, two I just published, it took me 10 years to write these. One is Saving Literacy, How Marks Change Minds, and this is for professional caregivers of, of very young children. Uh -huh. So, how Marx changed mine, attention, connection, and literacy. And then for parents, I wrote, Handmade Marx, A Child's Way into Literacy. So these books are slightly different, slightly different information. Mm -hmm. They have the same drawing, writing, five step. Okay. They have a taxonomy of scribbles and drawing by uh, Rhoda Kellogg and a woman named Sylvia Fine, whom I used as my sort of experts on early mark making. And I dignified scribbling by having early scribbling, mm -hmm. middle, and later high. And they're all organized mm -hmm. in these books. Mm -hmm. And then early, middle, and high drawing. Okay. Um, with rough guidelines, developmental guidelines, for more or less the age that a child would be when they're doing this Don't without any hard and fast rules. Because as Ella at three is becoming interested yep. in speech. My feeling is I had a grandson who didn't say anything till three except ut. <laughs> no mama, no dada, but ut. Mm -hmm. That signing has helped Ella speak mm -hmm. even maybe earlier or more fulsomely yep. than she might have. Yeah. So you've brought up a very important point. Yeah. One needs to rest in the development of the child unless there's something, yeah. a really <clears throat> a red flag. And I think if the child grows up scribbling and drawing, and you engage mm -hmm. in scribbling and drawing in with process. Ella, Clara. and your Clara, it's Clara, okay. Clara, and um, show her your interest, and yeah. th that she has the best chance of developing normally for, for Clara. That's perfect. I, I do think that once she has started to speak, right. we've noticed her vocabulary is through the roof. Right. It's, it's just really right. amazes me, and it, it is grows amazing. all the time. It is amazing. Yeah. When you spoke about uh, signing, my, um, one of my grandchildren was raised with, with, uh, with signing, and he and I were able to communicate a yeah. great deal more. So I think that is a very important, mm -hmm. newish way mm -hmm. with pre-verbal children. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that they can. Well, but we still get con we still get concerned. I think as young parents, if our children aren't necessarily verbal right. when we think they should be, right. um, and I, I think when you can pay attention to things other than that, when That's you can, true. When you That's can really focus in on yes. the, all the work that you've right. done, what they can do, yeah, and make it make sense at home. I mean, exactly. You know, some folks. I mentioned That's this when we were speaking right. earlier. Some folks that may watch this today right. are going to be really drawn into the neurobiology right. of this. Uh, and then there will be parents and teachers and such that may say, okay, just make it make sense to me right. as, um, as a mom exactly. or as a grandparent yes. who witnesses my grandchild. Yes. And you know, I, maybe I have a daughter-in-law or, or a son-in-law who's a little worried. And right. how can I assure them? Or how can we introduce scribbling and drawing? Or how can I pay attention to yes. that these things are happening? Therefore. 
we're pretty much right on track for this little one exactly. where they need to be. Right. I tried to write these two books, Saving Literacy and Handmade Marks, for those two different audiences. Mm -hmm. So the one for parents has some brain science, not that parents can't understand absolutely, everything absolutely. at the highest level, but to make it sort of more intuitive. And I yeah. do think that parents intuitively know how to parent. Absolutely. And elementary school teachers intuitively know that, yeah. that drawing is really important. And so I guess my books provide the research, the, the powerful rationales mm -hmm. from many fields, mm -hmm. you know, from biology, from anthropology, uh, from neuroscience, mm -hmm. um, cognitive science, to, <laughs> to dignify the That's importance right. Yeah. of scribbling and drawing. They aren't just for children, they're critical for yeah. child development, but they are important for our whole lifetimes. Yeah. I definitely want to make sure, so don't let me forget, I, don't right. want, I want to come back and talk to you a little bit about that, the, the different stages of life. So, uh, you know, we can, we can emphasize today that absolutely. importance of early childhood development, but you have touched a couple times on the fact that you, you work this process with people of all ages. All ages, and elder hostlers, yeah. I, I taught elder hostlers right after lunch mm. at Deerfield Academy. Now you'd okay. think everyone would go to sleep, yeah. that's right. <laughs> but when you're drawing and writing, and I chose mm. things like to draw, a pl it was very moving, we all sort of end up weeping, mm. draw someone you'll never see again, or draw a place you can never go again, and it was very moving. Yeah. And then they wrote about these things, and then um, we went through the drawing writing five step, mm. but they were, they have so much to bring. Yeah. And when they drew the person, We'd have them draw, I'd have them draw all the accoutrements, mm -hmm. how they looked, but what they wore, yeah. and you know, what creatures were around. And mm -hmm. it just brought, drawing is an incredible it's way crazy. to access a huge amount of mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. And then you can tag it all with language. Mm -hmm. And then you can write stories. We, we write sestinas, you know, yeah. uh, interesting things. Well, we could poems. probably talk for we days. Could. I'd love we to could. sit and we share could. a cup of tea and yeah. talk about, we will. Um, you we know, will. How, I mean, I think of, it, coming out of the mental health field yes. and being a social worker for 13 years, uh, I think of the importance of drawing and writing to people of trauma abuse histories or yes. uh, folks who are experiencing speech impediments, yes. language disorders, learning disabilities. Yes. It's profound. Yes, and um, the neurobiology behind that would be that a either a functional part of the brain can remediate for a dysfunctional yeah. part or that there is something called neural drift so that a functional part of the brain can extend okay. its, its abilities to places that are damaged. Mm -hmm. And so now we know that you know, new neurons are created. Yeah. And so you can, you can do amazing things. And you know that from your background and, and recovery, whether it's physical yes. recovery or it's uh, that the, that neurological. That the yeah. neurological remediation is possible to one extent. Yes. Probably well, we don't know the answer yeah, to. Exactly. Yeah, and like you said, you, you'd think you'd write the final book on, but we're still learning about our brain Everything. development every Everything. day. Everything. Um, That's right. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, I know that there's a lot to talk about, and you had a few points, um, so please. Thank you. <laughs> You're the perfect person to talk to because of the, the depth of your background and also your being a mother. Mm -hmm. One thing I wanted to talk about, besides my own work, though, there's a woman in Maine who. <coughs> actually was in school with my daughter, uh, Jessica at Bates, who's written a book called Transformational Mothering. And she has a website uh, about uh, lullabies. Her name is mm -hmm. Amy Robbins Wilson. So I spent some time listening to her, mm -hmm. uh, going through her videos on her website and seeing how, she calls it Mommy Jingles, that's her website, mm -hmm. how singing to newborns or infants when you're bathing them or putting mm -hmm. them to bed is, is a wonderful way to get them to do all these things. Mm -hmm. And so I started to think about more about sound and singing. So there was that little bit. And the rhythm that rhythm, is established. But yeah. yes, and, and that intimacy between yeah. mother-child. Yeah. I wrote something called The Peekaboo Principle about, in both books, yeah. about this critical intimacy between the mother and child and shared gaze. And evidently one of the telltales of a child who is born autistic rather than what I called acquired autism is that they avoid the maternal gaze. From the get-go? Yeah, from the get-go. And then I write about that. It's extremely important. So this mm -hmm. gaze when you're, you know, if you're nursing the baby or if you're feeding the baby a mm -hmm. bottle, this 
um, it was called at arm's length, mm -hmm. is so important for mm -hmm. your child's mm -hmm. visual development. But a woman contacted me online from Canada, and I had written a paper about uh, sound frequencies. And she suggested I read a book by Robert Whitaker called Anatomy of an Epidemic. And he mm -hmm. also wrote Mad in America mm -hmm. about uh, sort of the overuse of psychopharms mm -hmm. and uh, that maybe drugs are important in some cases, but in many cases, the more you take them, the more, the more depressed you are yeah. or the more psychotic yeah. you are, whatever. And certainly counter addicted in children. We have a big uh, prescription of yep. drugs for children yeah. nowadays. So I read this book. And I was very moved by this book. The woman who uh, emailed me is named Launa, Launa Tallman, T-A-L-L-M-A-N. Okay. She's written a book called Listening for the Light, plus two very scholarly monographs about the importance of the right middle ear, that is the stapes muscle and the stapesius, which is the uh, stirrup, mm -hmm. how those um, vibrate in response to sound and that the right middle ear, as it communicates with the left hemisphere, makes us what's called left hemisphere dominant, which okay. we want to be. Mm -hmm. So uh, early, the early sonic environment, you know, the visual environment for the baby, you want a mobile in the mother's sure. face, and we know what to do. I mean, scribbling and drawing, yeah. and, and I want to talk a, a little bit about electronics and what to avoid mm -hmm. about computers and all that. But the sonic environment, how the child, what the fetus hears and what the, the newborn hears is really, really, really important. And in fact, uh, I'll just tell you, that just these books will all be on my website, but many of the listeners, the watchers, will have read Alpha Tomatis, yeah. yeah. so the ear and the voice. A fellow who uh, worked with Tomatis and followed along, Guy Berard, wrote, hearing equals behavior. Mm -hmm. Now that is major mm -hmm. because it suggests that if you're attention deficit, you're learning disabled, you're autistic, you're schizophrenic, uh, you're depressed, it has something to do with your hearing. Sure. Now hearing not only as um, the way we generally think about hearing, that mm -hmm. something comes in and we, mm -hmm. we decode it as language, but hearing as properly processing all of the sensory information yeah. in the body is processed yeah. by the middle ear. Yeah. Well, you know that. That's fantastic. Yeah. I didn't know that. What that level of input is. It's incredible. Yeah. So if your right middle ear isn't getting the information properly because the, the muscle is, uh, the stapesius muscle is not at the right turgor, mm -hmm. and if you're too darn stressed, you'll withdraw, mm -hmm. and that muscle will relax, and therefore you will miss out on a certain range yeah. of frequencies, particularly high frequencies. Wow. So these books, and including When Listening Comes Alive by this guy, Paul Madoyle, th these books, and they were written maybe 30, uh, 30 or so years ago, yeah. were so amazing to me. And quite ahead of their time. They were way ahead of yeah. their time. And that's why nobody paid any attention. Yeah. But how, but how many you times do we spend, I mean, we, we, this is fairly stereotypical, but we watch, I know in the, it, from the mental health world, you watch people diagnosed, if they're accurately diagnosed with um, ADD, ADHD, or schizophrenia. Right. You know, they've got earphones, more than not. Or people can focus in because they're walking around major cities in New York or Boston, and right. they're plugged in, they've right. got earbuds, right. kind of tuning other stuff out. Right. I, I watch my little one, she often wears a hat. She was right. premature. Right. And I, I'm always curious. Right. I, I have no proof. She's probably hypo, um, what's called hypoacoustic. But she really can't handle too right. much input. Exactly. And she is extremely drawn to music yeah. and art. Right. And she's extremely loving and compassionate. Right. At the same time, she has always, she falls asleep best if she has pressure on top of her head. Right. And she, you know, she, she doesn't walk around in a hat in, in times that it would be inappropriate. But I've never fought her in the winter or rain to put a hat on. She loves to have right. a hat on. Right. We went to the... Big Apple Circus last weekend, right. and it was too much. Right. She just kept plugging exactly. her ears. Well, you brought up, I can't tell you how important the point is you brought up, because the sonic environment for us as adults and for fetuses and little children is really becoming difficult. There's, yeah. there's a huge amount of noise. And if you think huge. of the noise that the 
let's say your fetus or your newborn mm -hmm. has to deal with, it, it, let's say the television yeah. is up quite loudly or there's a sound system up quite loudly. We all know that youngsters who are wearing headphones or, or their little buds or whatever are ruining their hearing. Mm -hmm. So uh, your, your daughter, Clara, is, is, is signaling that she wants to protect yeah. herself. So we need to have our houses more, more quiet, mm -hmm. more, more sensitive to the fact that the child really needs to hear the frequencies, the high frequencies mm -hmm. of language. And this leads me into Campbell's The Mozart Effect, yeah. and this guy Joshua leads as The Power of Sound. Um, the reason that there is a Mozart effect is that, first of all, classical music has all the different the instruments ranges. and a great many uh, instruments that have really super high frequency, mm -hmm. so the flute and the violin. So Mozart concertos give the listener a huge amount of high frequency sound. High frequency sound is hugely energizing. Mm -hmm. The point that I had not understood is that as sound comes into the ear, it's changed into electrical energy, mm -hmm. and that's 90% of what the brain needs. Wow. You think, oh, the brain needs glucose, the brain needs oxygen. Well, not much. That's huge. It's huge. So, and the vagus nerve, which goes from all of our organs and then it goes to the right middle ear, it's going to communicate uh, the sounds or the frequencies that come into the body to all your organs. And each of our organs resonates at a slightly uh, different frequency that's optimal for it. So if we're in a hideous, well, maybe you shouldn't use the word hideous, but an overwhelming sound environment, it's going to be very, very bad on our organs. Uh, it may cause withdrawal in a child. If the child withdraws, you know, it's really sort of understandable, but then they may but have... But the domino a, effect of all yeah. of that. Yeah, so they don't understand language, or they don't want to listen, or, or uh, you know, they have what I call, you know, sort of acquired autism mm -hmm. is really understandable, because yeah. they're trying to protect themselves. Wow. The book, Joshua Leeds' book, The Power of Sound, is, is, is a really simple uh, sort of general approach to all of this. But if I were... Uh, reading nowadays, uh, I would so recommend for watchers is uh, Berard's Hearing Equals Behavior and When Listening Comes Alive. Okay. And those will be on my website. They're just, they're very startling because you wouldn't think that all your be behavior depends upon how your ear hears. The, way, the reason uh, this woman Tallman is different is because she's talking about how the right ear helps the left hemisphere to be dominant and you want that because you want your language system and your belief system mm -hmm. to be able to say control your emotions yeah. Yeah. control your intuitions so you don't go off the deep end all the time mm -hmm. you need somebody riding the to elephant somebody That's riding right. the elephant That's right. Well, yeah. we, we unfortunately, I think for today, and I really do, I want to sincerely Can I just invite you back. The preschool? Yes, please do. Okay. I, would, I just wanted to, if, if you're looking for a preschool, choose... one of the most important things you um, will ever do. Ever do. Uh, you choose one with lots of art. Now you yes. say, well, what is art, creativity? Just forget all the things you've thought about art and think about it as marks of meaning. The child is making marks of meaning which engage the child in terms of, at of attention. Mm -hmm. Uh, and help the child to become in love with meaningful marks, which means that the child would be interested in reading mm -hmm. and writing and mathematics, mm -hmm. you know, all that business. The other thing to look for in this preschool is its music program. If the ear is critical to the welfare of the entire body, as well as the child being able to relate to language, use language, you want a music program where the child is listening to music but also singing music, mm -hmm. matching tones, uh, very active in music. Mm -hmm. Also, I might say that in an early reading program, you want to look for one where the child is encouraged to read aloud so the child hears their own voice. Mm -hmm. That's so important. There's a lot. I know there's a lot bubbling under there that you could continue to say about that. Can't so anymore. Yeah, right. you, you have one more? Yeah, one please. More. Right. I think it's really important. <laughs> well, I was thinking this morning, too, about uh, I tend to think now a bit about uh, survival. And uh, I have a farm in Maine, and I have hens and gardens and all of this. I was thinking, what if we lose power? Mm. Even a week? Mm -hmm. And you look in, in Japan with, with earthquakes, 
and the New York Times was saying that people were really destitute without their cell phones and their iPods and their, their laptops. They had no way to get information. And um, evidently there's a little radio station, but I thought, what if, what if this happens? The child who can draw, the child who can write, yeah. there's a lot of dysgraphia now. Children don't yeah. know how to write because they're not writing. Yeah. There's a lot more Excellent. speech. Uh, problems, uh, speech pathologists are noticing this because children aren't encouraged to speak. Mm -hmm. It's disuse of speech, it's disuse of graphos, and if we're facing times when even let's say there's a little blackout, no TV, mm -hmm. no computers, we want people to be able to, to draw and write. Mm -hmm. And one tiny more point, screen vision and the sonic environment, digital sound, are degraded. Yeah. This is crucial. So the child watching the TV, the computer screen, or little handheld games, what they're receiving is way degraded as visual information. Plus the sound is degraded. Yeah. If you take a little organism. OK. okay. <laughs> we have so much we can talk about. So um, you're on the hook now. You're coming back. Coming you're back. coming back for part two. We All thank right. you very much for watching today with Susan Sheridan on Key News.